Hi, everyone, and welcome to our session. Today, Kansen, Simon, and myself are going to talk a little bit about some of the work that we're doing in Linux Mainline to enable a new high-performing IAPath that we're calling a synchronous IAPath tour. We're obviously going to cover what we mean by this and what are the use cases we're after, and then we're going to deep dive into the changes that we're making in Linux and in other places in the, the storage stack to enable this path. Before we get started, um, I want to make clear that while some of the parts of, of this work are already upstream, think, things change very quickly. There is still a number of elements that are under, under discussion in the Linux kernel mailing list. So things, again, might change. And I also want to make very clear that some of the work that we're presenting here is, um, is a community effort. So, you know, we presented some of these ideas, applied some of the feedback, got a lot of conversations into the mailing list. And just to name a few of the people that have been involved directly into this work are James, Christoph, and Keith. There has been many others. So, you know, if you're interested in the topic, I would encourage you to subscribe to the mailing list, follow the conversation and participate of the things that are already or still under debate. <clears throat> we are dividing the presentation in three main parts. First, I'm going to talk about the work we're doing in NVMe to enable these internal pass through path. What is the motivation? What are the things that we want to cover? Um, how it relates? To, to the rest of the iPads that are already available in Linux. Then Kanchan, he's going to talk about asynchronous IACTOS, which is a very necessary work for this NVMe internal pass through to be able to perform and scale. And then Simon at the end, he's gonna wrap everything up and he's gonna talk to you about how you use this path and the work that we are doing in XNVMe to provide this common storage API for all these paths to, to come together. Um, and he's gonna use the opportunity to, to guide you through a demo and give you some performance numbers uh, on real world applications. So if you look at Linux today, you traditionally have two main ways of submitting IO. You have your file IO, which is very convenient and very easy from an application perspective. If you want more control, then applications would rely on the raw block interface. This is very convenient if you want this control. Um, you see the whole LDA address space. Um, you can control a lot of the IO properties, whether you want asynchronous or synchronous, or whether you want to do direct IO and implement your own cache or leverage the, the kernel a page cache, QDEP, priorities, all that. And a number of applications have been very successful at leveraging this for implementing all sorts of things on top, like object stores or key values and things like that. For NVMe specifically, these uh, the block device, as you know, is namespace and granularity, so it fits very well, right? The block layer is fantastic. Um, but when you're building this common block abstraction, uh, it comes with some natural limitations. So just to name a few, I believe we're all aware that there is a number of these data protection schemes, like uh, protection information, uh, DFX combinations that are not support it. So something that is very used in, in enterprise environments, uh, this 4K plus 64 in a contiguous buffer, something that the block layer does not support today. So these people basically, when, when they plug the devices, <coughs> they, they don't see the block device come up. Or sometimes even worse, there is this inconsistent interface where sometimes the block device comes up, but it comes with capacity zero, which means you cannot use it. So it's not really useful, uh, right? We also have constraints for new device types. To give an example in CNS, um, the block layer puts some constraints that make a lot of sense for the kernel, which is having a power of two zone sizes or enforcing the use of the append command. If you don't want to use these, uh, these, uh, these features, um, 
then the block device would not come up. I'm sure there are other reasons, but I believe this has had an impact on explaining the rise of SPDK. Because SPDK got a number of things very right. Um, they understood that there is these applications that want a very fast, low latency IO path they have control over. Because a number of applications can build this domain specific, um, you can call it domain specific block layers or domain specific abstractions because the application knows the workload. I don't know, you know that you're writing at 32K, you can optimize for that. Um, you know that the application is respecting your maximum data transfer size. You don't need to implement splits, you know, these type of things. I think there's no discussion that SPDK paved the way uh, for, for all these low latency storage stacks. Today we see IOU ring matching this performance and it's great, but the applications are ready, most probably because they did a lot of work already on SPDK. And at the end of the day, I think when you put this all together, SPK got very right that there is a number of people that want to do this end-to-end -end optimizations. So either because you want to keep it as a vendor specific, because you control your whole storage stack, or before because you want to do some type of POCs before you bring it to the technical working group in NVMe or to your vendor. Um, so it allows for this fast innovation where you can do a number of things, create your command, speak in VME to your device, and then go all the way down. However, you know, the more popular SPDK becomes, the more generic it becomes. And then we start having this redundancy on some of the features that are traditionally the operating system responsibility, which now are being moved to user space in order to cover this necessity. So, the main question here is, can we bring this functionality to an IO path that goes inside of the kernel so that we can reuse all the kernel functionality, you know, your security, your, um, you know, whether you want to do C groups, whether you want to, you know, to use whatever containers, you know, avoid, avoid the redundancy that comes from putting a lot of this logic in user space. And this is where the NVMe generic device comes in place. <clears throat> what it is, is pretty simple. When you get a new namespace, it comes typically as a block device, you know, your NVMe X and Y, zero and one and two, three, et cetera. Now you will see also a car device coming on the side, very similar to the car device that comes for the controller, like NVMe 0 and NVMe 1. This device will always be available. And so if some of the features of that NVMe namespace are not supported by the block layer, the block device will be rejected or, or come up as capacity zero or as read only. But the car device will always be there. And this device would allow you to send IOCTALs directly into the driver, meaning that you have this communication where you can submit an NVMe command that you form in user space and the device will understand that. <clears throat> and the path goes entirely through the kernel. If you want to compare that to what it looks in the SPDK, it is very similar in terms that if you're using the lowest a SPDK API for the NVMe driver, you will be speaking NVMe, but the namespace will, or, or actually the whole device will not be detached from the kernel. You know, the PCA device will not be detached and put into user space, it will still be within the kernel. This gives you some interesting use cases <clears throat> because then, you know, you can think of, a normal server with several drives. Some of them, if they have several namespaces, can have like a normal file system uh, put into them. And a namespace in the same device can be used uh, as a pass-through without you know, having to touch the whole device. So you, you have much more flexibility in that sense. It also gives you a common stack 
for implementing these kind of security policies where you don't need to have some part of these policies in user space, some part of these policies within kernel space. So this is the main target. SCSI has had something similar for quite a long time. UFS, to the best of my knowledge, this doesn't exist, but if this is a use case that, uh, that becomes uh, interesting, especially uh, after the uh, asynchronous IR tasks get merged, we can look into enable that. For NVMe, we merged this in 5.13. Um, there's support for the IOCTAL IO. There's basic support for NVMe CLI. And um, you know, we're having some patches upstream in, in the next week or so for having all this uh, support uh, enabled. How does it look like if you want to consume the NVMe generated device? So as I mentioned before, now you not only are going to see your DEF and BME 0 and 1 and 2 and 3 as the different namespaces on, on, on the block device, you're going to see this uh, ND D from generic and the same numeration. This is um, coming from MBME CLI. Now you can see the patches here. That's what I mentioned before. This is the part that is missing for the list on NDME and we're, you know, we're posting the patches soon. If you want to use the um, this from uh, you know the programming interface, this looks like a typical IOP code. So you would form the NVMe command as a normal NVMe uh, IOP code, the same one that is existing today. Um, this means obviously that performance uh, is not very well good because it's a it's a, it's a synchronous interface. Kanchan will talk about the work we're doing to use IO during and make this scale and actually be usable for the IO path. Good thing about using the NVMe driver in the kernel is that it is pretty simple for us to enable fabrics because it is automatic, <laughs> just as it is uh, in, when, when it is enabled as a, as a block interface, the device is up. When it is not, we need to enable the pass-through controller. This is something that is easy to do. And when it is done, all the functionality comes basically for free, which is very, you know, it's very convenient. So this is it for the MME generated device. Um, Kanchan will take over and he will talk about asynchronous IACTOS. If you have any questions about this part in particular, you know, please, Right through Slack or reach out to us afterwards. Thank you, Javier. So now let's delve into the catch all system call that has been around since so many years. It's called IO control or in short, IO tell. Many operations which do not fit well into the existing system calls are done by IO tell. But uh, despite the fact that, that it's been massively used for doing a variety of stuff, IO tell remains uh, synchronous to this date. And we are going to talk about turning it asynchronous with the help of our URI. But before that, let's uh, uh, touch base with our URI. It, it came into kernel in 2019, provides a scalable infra for doing async IO, both for file and for network as well. Unlike the Linux AIO, it allowed doing async buffer IO too. And uh, at this point, lots of system call beyond read and write, I mean, have already found their async variant within the IU ring uh, infra. Making directories, link and symlink are the few uh, recent examples of that. If we look at the communication uh, between the user and kernel part of the IU ring, so the backbone here is a pair of ring buffer that kernel creates and uses space maps. And that allows further transition to happen with the reduced number of system calls and memory copies. And the programming model after we set up the ring would be to pick a free submission uh, queue entry, SQE from the submission queue, fill it up with relevant opcode and uh, all the other information that your operation may require. And we can fill up uh, more such SQEs make a bunch of it. And once we are done doing that, we could submit all these entries by doing a single system call, which is called IURing enter. 
And at some later point of time, we can reap the completion by looking at the CQ ring. So if the tail and head of the CQ are not at the same position, we have got a completion. And that's about it to keep it simple. A, a lot more is possible, like elimination of uh, submission, uh, submission system call by enabling SQ offload and doing the completion without relying on interrupts. But then in this slide, I am only scratching the surface uh, of it. Far more has been said on IO ring in a much better way. For example, this, this talk, uh, faster IO through IO ring by Jens, would be excellent to give year two. And uh, now we, we go into how IO ring can deliver an async IO fill. First thing first, in the current and the next slide, I'm talking about the work that Jens has done to wire up async IO fill. Let's start with the user interface part of it. How does it look like to a Uring user? So the feature currently is called Uring command and it is triggered by passing this new opcode called Uring OP Uring command. Apart from this new opcode, there is this new type of submission queue entry and it's called uh, command SQE or CSQE in short. As you can see in the figure here, the CSQE is of same size as regular SQE, that's 64 bytes, but CSQE is spatial in the sense that it has got 40 bytes of free space. And which is what we refer as payload in subsequent slides. Uh, and this payload can be used by application to store uh, IOPTL command itself. So it's going to save the allocation cost if the IOPTL command happens to be smaller than 40 bytes. And if the command is larger, application can allocate it uh, by some other way and put, and put the pointer of the command inside the CSQE payload, I mean. And uh, of course, these are two ways, but uh, that, I, that I mentioned over here, but other ways to use the payload are also possible. And uh, coming back to, to once, we, once we are done setting up the CSQE and its payload, we send it down the usual way and we read the completion in the usual way. It is to be noted that IURing does not peek into the payload or enforces many rules around it. It merely passes it down to the IOPTL provider and which can have its own um, custom logic to process the, the, the payload. And uh, here we look at the internal communication model between the IURing and the IOPTL provider, which could be a file system or could be a driver. So IOPTL starts by fetching the, the CSQE that user supplied and sets up an internal container called IOPTL command. And that container is cardinal for all the further communication. The, sec the second part is <clears throat> whoever is the IOPTL provider, uh, it can participate in this business of making the IOPTL async by implementing this new file operation called Uring command. So Uring essentially submits the IOPTL to the provider by, by calling this particular method. And uh, when provider takes charge, it does whatever needs to be done for submission and returns without blocking. It can uh, return the results instantly, or it can say that it requires some more time to send the result. And for that case, it's whenever it, it has the result, it is going to uh, pass it back to the IU ring by calling another helper, which is currently called IU ring command done. You could see all this in the sequence diagram here. And once the result reaches to the IU ring, it does post this particular result into the CSQE and we are done. Moving on, we, we look at employing the async IOPTL for the NVMe pass-through interface. So as we see in the figure here, we have a bunch of abstractions stacked up on the storage device, and each one is, is having its own purpose. With the pass-through interface, kernel is exposing a path which kind of cuts through all these layers, all these abstractions. And this can be useful to try out some, some new features. Uh, especially in NVMe, we know that uh, the features are emerging fast. And uh, without this, we, uh, 
all these features basically take some time to move up the, the, the letters of uh, abstractions over here. At times when it is about building a file or user interface on top of a new device feature, some, some sort of opaqueness need to be designed uh, so that the interface would be, uh, can be reused in future and it, it allows future extension. Um, but pass through skips all that and the feature can be, uh, uh, it can be used uh, readily. But the problem is that the pass through travels via a blocking IOPTL and that makes it almost useless for fast devices like NVMe. So Endeavor here is to build a new pass through interface, which is scalable. And uh, by combining it with the IUNING advancement, we do imagine a much more uh, useful uh, interface. So here, if we look at the NVMe IOPTL, it is about forcing the sync behavior over async. The, the NVMe interface is naturally async. Host submits the command and it can go back to its business, host the submission. And it's the driver which implements the sync behavior by putting the submitter go into a blocking weight. In the new scheme of things, I'm talking about the, the URIN command uh, here. So for the NVMe care device, we add the URIN command handler and that does nothing more than, than decoupling the completion from submission. At high level, that's, that's what it is. And uh, there won't be any blocking weight. So uh, one of the problem which is worth to mention here is that, uh, which I, I refer as async update to user memory. So it's a general problem if, if a IOPTL command has some field which need to be updated during the IO completion. Because such fields, are in user space and they cannot be touched while we are running in the interrupt contest. And typically the, the completion of a IO arrive in, in interrupt contest. So uh, to solve that, if you look at the sequence over here, NVMe driver sets up a callback to do all that update. And that particular callback function, it supplies to the IO ring. Then IO ring sets up something called a task work, uh, which is uh, kernel's mechanism to to schedule a work into, uh, into a, a, a user space task. And with that, uh, the callback that driver supplied gets executed in the task context and we could do the update. Now let's look at the example over here. So uh, we could see that we open the CAD device and G0 and one, and then we allocate a pass-through command structure. We set it up in a regular way. But what we do is that we uh, put this particular command uh, inside the command SQE payload. And once we have done that, we could uh, submit it in a, in a regular way. And uh, then we can, we can read the completion and, and, and that's about it. Uh, that would be a way to do uh, the reading from the device uh, from, uh, from this particular new interface. Some of the tidbits for the GNS users, if we look at it, so it is possible to, to do the async zone reset. Currently, the zone reset is possible only via the zone management command, and zone management command is, is sent by IOPTEL. And uh, the other uh, useful thing could be to send the zone append command at higher QD. In, um, so currently zone append is usable inside the kernel, but it's, uh, it's not exposed to the user space. And uh, this could be uh, one of the way to do that. While having the interface async is the first thing to do, it doesn't have to be the only thing. Since uh, NVMe is talking to IORing directly, we seem to have room for adding some more goodness in the pass-through uh, interface and uh, in uh, async IOPTL in general. So IORing has a bunch of features beyond async I mean, to, to make the IO faster. And some of those are listed in this table. 
we have register file, which is about reducing the cost of acquiring and uh, releasing the file references inside the kernel. And there is SQ pool, which enables uh, application to, 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 to submit the IO without doing the system call at all. And we have fixed buffer and async pooling, which we will cover in detail anyway in the further slides. The first two feature in this table, the register file and the SQ pool, they become available with the intra that we discussed in previous slides. While the other two feature, uh, they require some new plumbing, uh, both at the Uring and uh, at the NVMe driver. So we, we start uh, with the fixed buffer support uh, for uh, Uring pass through. How can we go about doing that? But before that, let's look at what is fixed buffer. So um, the last or maybe the second last thing to, to do, uh, we, we, uh, before we submit the IO to the NVMe device is, is making the buffers DMA ready. And for that to happen fine, we got to pin the buffers in memory. And generally, this is a per IO cost. We, we pin the buffer for the IO and unpin it once the IO is done. With, with fixed buffer, this per IO work is, is not done. Uh, in place of that, application pins the buffer once and uh, goes about reusing these uh, pinned or pre-mapped buffers subsequently. For this support, we, we add a new upcode in the IU ring, which is similar to the original U ring command, but it acts on the fixed buffer uh, instead. So it's called I U ring, uh, U, U ring command fixed. And uh, application uses this, this code to submit the IO and uh, tells which pmap the buffer to be used by its index. Buff index is shown in the figure over here. On the NVMe side, driver stops doing this, the, the per IO pin and unpin, and uh, it talks to IU ring to, to obtain the pre-pinned buffer. Now we uh, look at the second feature, which is about pass-through polling. But before that, let's, let's take a cursory look at the infra that kernel has for IO polling. So IO polling became relevant, particularly after the emergence of low latency storage. And the intra, the the classical mean to indicate the completion of IO, it started to become a non-trivial software overhead for such devices. So, so in the current polling model, uh, device stops generating the interrupts while the submitter actively checks for the completion. Uh, originally, the, the kernel had the sync polling infra when, when application submits the IO. And after that, it, it starts spinning on the CPU looking for the completion actively. That was referred as the classical polling. Uh, obviously, at times it became heavy handed on the CPU and people added the option of hybrid polling. With that application uh, puts itself to sleep while uh, for some time while, while looking for completion. Uh, the, the system called to do uh, this kind of uh, sync polling RP read V2, P write V2 with the high prime option. And uh, then, then came async polling with the with the IU ring. So, uh, so, so it, it basically boils down to this fundamental question that that what that uh, what all choices do we have after submitting an IO while we have already disabled the interrupts? We can spin. That's one thing to do, and uh, we can sleep and spin. That's what we do with the hybrid polling. That would be the second option. With the async polling, we get this third option of doing something something useful like submitting another IO or maybe some, some other app specific stuff. And, and that's possible because polling has been decoupled from submission. Uh, in order to use the, the async polling in IO ring, we need to set uh, we need to set it up with a with a flag here. And uh, then all the IO we uh, we we do via that ring uh, that becomes polled IO. Uh, now we look at how can we wire up the polling support uh, in the Uring pass through. So figure in the left, uh, uh, it shows the per core queues at the block layer. Uh, these are referred as the SCTX software contests. And we uh, these are mapped to the, the hardware context HCTX in, in, in sort. The HCTX corresponds to the NVMe SQ and CPU pair. Now, uh, 
from device side, uh, NVMe protocol allows to, to create NVMe CQ without interrupts. For such completion queues, device is only going to post the CQE and not going to generate the interrupt after that. So here in the figure, the, the green CQs are interrupt disabled while the blue ones are interrupt enabled. And uh, the same color coding applies for the CTX that's sitting above it. Now, uh, when we look at uh, uh, look at what needs to be done to enable the polling for urine command, uh, for the submission, we, we need to do two things. We need to ensure that the IO is placed on a polled at CTX, the green one. And uh, once we once we place it, so we are showing that that IO placement within that CTX uh, with the orange color, uh, and uh, that is that is that is the cookie for the command. So, so cookie basically tells uh, that CTX and uh, the command ID. While the the second thing to do would be to remember this cookie because completion would be done at later point of time. So, so we stored this, uh, this cookie into the IURing command structure itself. And that's about submission. Uh, and when, when caller decides to do the polling for the completion, we, we pick the corresponding IURing command. We obtain the cookie from it and we send it to something called BLK poll, which uh, implements the, the, the infra uh, of uh, classical polling as well as hybrid polling. So it takes a cookie as an input and it uses it to identify the relevant CTX and the corresponding NVMe CQ. And uh, then it starts polling that particular NVMe CQ. Once it finds the, the completion, the job is over. Now, if you take a step back and, and look at the table, uh, comparing uh, the paths, it, it looks much better than before. We, yes, we, we still have a gap because recently one more advancement uh, has got added into the bunch and that's called biocache or bio recycling. It, it's, it's a transparent optimization as far as user space is concerned um, because nothing extra needs to be done. Uh, nothing extra needs to be specified from, uh, from user space. And that is, that is what makes it different from uh, rest of the feature. We'll be having this feature added as we, as we move along this path. And now, now all, all said and done, um, the, the, uh, the whole NVMe pass through interface, whether we talk about the, the new one, the new IU ring one, or the, the existing, uh, existing IOCTL one, it, it expects application to speak in native language. Uh, that means the application need to pass the NVMe commands to talk to NVMe device. Uh, so uh, I will pass it over to Simon, uh, who is going to talk about what, what, what can we do about that part? Uh, how best to consume this interface and how this interface performs. Thank you, Kanchan. Yeah. And, um, I will specifically be talking about uh, three things. And the first is um, one way of consuming the car device and specifically why you might wanna do it in that way. And second, we'll be giving you a demo of how the different tooling around uh, this usage um, works such that you can try it out yourself. It will be quite uh, pragmatic. Uh, it includes tools such as FIO for evaluating performance such that you can go ahead and do that yourself. And third, well, that's about evaluating the performance of the car device compared to what's currently available today and other ways of shipping pass-through commands to your device. All right, starting with one, we are, we'll go back here looking at this figure again. Uh, because one way of consuming the car device and the async pass-through path provided uh, in these new patches, well, that is to use the example that Kenshin showed you. That is, construct the HQE and send that down the IOU ring path um, uh, as you would normally do. However, what we want to do is also do stuff like FIO. We want to do a performance evaluation of the interface 
We also want to look a bit at the tooling and how you can um, talk with your NVMe devices on the command line. So we actually want to experiment with this interface, uh, this new system interface, through a bunch of different application and tooling interfaces. And to enable that, well, then we use XNVMe. And XNVMe is the smallest amount of software abstraction um, that you need in order to encapsulate a bunch of different uh, operating system and system interfaces into a single programmable API. And by doing so, then the different tools already provided by XNVMe, such as the command line tool for sending administrative commands and shipping other IO commands through the command line, well, we can just reuse that. And also for the performance evaluation, we can use the XNVMe FIO IO engine um, when we do that performance evaluation. And then we just need to implement that small part inside of the XNVMe runtime, and we can then do have this comparative study. So that is sort of a quick overview of either you can like go down and do the, the low level coding yourself, or you can use something like XNME. And we'll be looking at the tooling on how to do that. So just think of XNME as that uh, command line library or command library where you can change your IO path without changing a single line of code. It has the synchronous interface, buffer management, and also a queuing based interface with callbacks so you submit your command by putting it into your queue, it completes and invokes your callback function. So that's sort of the general interface of XNVMe with a bunch of tooling on top. So let's uh, go to two and see how that works. So let's jump into the tooling. And uh, this is a brief overview of what we'll be looking at. First off on the on the command line tooling part, and let's just jump right into device enumeration and looking at the specifics of CNS. As we mentioned, there was an append command that we really want to be able to ship over an asynchronous interface. So uh, here we enumerate our devices. We can see we have now one using the generic char device. There's also another one uh, using the, the regular block interface. And uh, when we want to ship our, um, our append command, then how you instrument, you have the same application and then you instrument the XNVMe runtime to use different backends. So now the AMO one is uh, using NVMe driver octals and the queues and callbacks are just emulation of the, that interface. And then we get a result from that. We can then shift that over to using the new IOU ring command interface on the generic chart device and shift the command over that instead. So this is just to show you how that tooling can be shifted. And if you want to, you can also uh, utilize the SPDK to ship your commands um, through that as well. I think it was just there, yeah. And the difference here is that now you're telling it to send it down to a PCIe address. And since that does not have the information about which namespace it is, which the, the, the other tools do here or the system interface does here, well, then we provide that to the tool. And then we ship it over that. Um, so that's just to show how you can shift these things without changing your code. Um, and for the most interesting part are the tooling needed to do the performance evaluation. Here we use FIO and the XMME FIO IO engine. It has a file job that looks like this, doing some 4K random reads. And um, yeah, the way you instrument that is telling it the file name, tell it to go to the generic device here and use the IOU ring command interface. And then you uh, just yeah, send that away. And it works in the, this is all the regular file instrumentation needed to run a FIO. And if you want to experiment with this yourself, um, you can also have a look at how you would ship this over um, using the SPDK NVMe driver instead. And that would look um, something like this, where what you should be aware about here is just that this colon is a special char and FIO, so you need to do uh, an escape of that. And again, we um, there's no information about the specific namespace, so we provide that to, to the tool as well. And then you can run that. Um, so it's the same FIO engine, same implementation in XNVMe. It's just instrumentation of that XNVMe library. 
And that's what we'll be using now in the, um, when going to, through the performance numbers. So let's have a look at that. Yeah, and so that was the tool part. Now let's look at the more interesting thing, which really is the performance part, saying, because we said that with NVMe pass-through, what we had before was an interface that wasn't scalable. We, we've mentioned that and performance was poor. So uh, what we mean by that, let's demonstrate it here. We're running FIO. Uh, well, as you increase your QDEV, you would expect that you're hiding some latency and you can then uh, get a higher throughput as you're processing those commands. But since everything is happening in a blocking synchronous fashion, then you have to wait for everything to complete, which also accumulates your uh, yeah the latency of doing each command now when we then uh, try to fix this in the ways we do today would be to then implement a thread pool and uh, such a thread pool is available in xmme you you just switch that xmme async uh, but what you can see then is that you're spending at the at qdev one it's slower than just being synchronous because you're paying a bunch of resource cost and context shifting in setting up your thread pool, which makes it slower. However, it does scale. So today, in case we didn't have IOU ring command, what we would do is then set up a thread pool to ship our commands over the IOCTL interface, but having this incurred cost of, um, of having a thread pool and using those resources uh, in, on the user space side. So that's really what we want to improve. We want something that's scalable and efficient. So let me show you uh, how things are looking today. So with, or how things might look in the future um, when this interface gets uh, upstream in the kernel. Well, what we have here is something that's more efficient than at QDEV1 that, than using the NVMe drive IOCTL plus it's scaling. So we're actually getting the both of best or both of the best of both worlds. Um, we're getting the ability to send more than read and write. And we're getting efficient scalability by using the IOU ring infrastructure. And we have all of that flexibility of sending any command down that we want. So that's great. Um, but other ways of also doing this today would be to use using something like the SPDK NVMe driver, as you just saw with the XNVMe tooling, where we could switch over and use that driver. So what does that look today? Well, that is uh, better. So we are achieving and hitting this peak here, which is the device max IOPS for, for 4K, 4K IO. And um, we're basically just having a QDOT1 lower overhead, and we, we hit that spot sooner. So there are still some things to improve in terms of uh, reducing latency of the user space to kernel interface. And um, Kenshin has talked a lot about these different optimizations of fixed buffers, different kinds of polling, and um, these different things we can do on, in, in that exchange between user space and kernel space. And let's look at what happens when we enable one of those. So what we do here is to reduce that gap a bit further. So we're going from the blue line here up to the magenta and we're approaching um, uh, what we get from being entirely in user space by enabling uh, completion polling inside of the kernel. Um, yeah, and there are of course other things that you can do to lower the overhead with fixed buffers that's not uh, being done here. So what we're doing here is purely just enabling that uh, polling logic. Um, yeah, so I think that's the, that's the main takeaway. So uh, with, the, with the car device and the async interface on top of it for pass-through commands, we came from a world that wasn't scalable. That's your synchronous IOCTOLs. Then we, you can try and do that in, a, in, a, in user space by adding a thread pool, but it's not very efficient. With IOU ring, we get that scalability with the IOU ring pass-through interface. And we can also enable optimization such as polling to make it even better. Um, so that's the main takeaway. If all you're seeing, then please uh, digest this. Now, uh, as mentioned on the upstreaming and ecosystem side of things, we have the NVMe generic device that is the NG0 
uh, popping up in the Linux kernel, it's available today and it's been available since 5.13. And the async like octal path, the way that we can actually ship these commands, which are not other than read and write, that's still an, on, uh, an ongoing upstreaming effort. And um, today you can go grab that from GitHub. Uh, the link is here. And the features included here are the async NVMe pass-through, the one we just used to send uh, a pen commands over, to send a pen commands over, and the polling feature here that got in, that improved um, our latency and our, and our IOP scaling. And um, XNVMe is also uh, readily avail available on GitHub, and currently it supports a lot of different IO paths, where traditional IO are POSIX, POSIX AIO, Linux's LibAIO, IO Uring. It supports the, the car device, the generic NVMe device, it supports the NVMe driver or octals on Linux, and it supports the SPDK NVMe driver. And uh, on Windows, there's support for um, doing some of these NVMe driver encapsulations for iOctals as well. Plus for your traditional IO, it does uh, IO control ports. And um, there are also similar support on FreeBSD, wrapping iOctals and doing uh, POSIX AIO for your regular read and write commands. So all of the emulation, the thread pooling, the NV, uh, NVMe driver encapsulation are basically running on all of these uh, different platforms. Uh, and now the experimental support for um, the async ioctals are also available, such that you can go and experiment with what we hope to be the future of an uh, IO, an async IO pass-through path for Linux. Yeah, so um, the last thing we have to say here is basically that, yeah, please do talk with us and you're very welcome to join our Discord channel. Uh, the name is uh, put up here. You can put that into Discord and find us and come hang out and talk. We all hang out on that Discord channel uh, on a daily basis. You're also very welcome to email us with any questions you might have, whether it's um, yeah, specifics to the kernel infrastructure, things to improve. We can, of course, always discuss that on the mailing list, or if it's uh, regarding XNVMe and how to use it and how we might see uh, getting this into other uh, open source projects out there. And um, so the very last thing to say is that we hope that you will take a moment to rate the session uh, since your feedback is quite important to us. But I will leave you on this slide and um, say thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs>